and he reacts. There's four spiritual leaderships we find, or principles that we find in Nehemiah. Compassion, a motivation for obedience. When you have compassion for the things of God and for this lost world, it'll bring you motivated for obedience. What do you mean? When you fall in love with Jesus Christ and you realize that his heartbeat is not that anybody should perish, but that all should come to repentance, and you begin to uh, get more uh, compassion for others and, and the things that they're, of their life, it'll also make you grow, and your motivation for obedience will grow with it. Cooperation is often required. Teamwork, community, the body, for example, um, when you cooperate with the ministry of the local assembly, you're not doing it just by yourself. You become a part of a team. I remember, when, and I'm going back to, to the Washington, because I'm not saying this as, as, as because Washington is, is a lowly, menial job. That's not the point that I'm trying to get here, and I want you to understand that. But it, the, the point is, is the attitude of the person doing the job. I remember in going into a large church. Uh, it was in Toronto, Canada, and I was doing a job there. This was before I became a full-time minister. And I went in, and I was working there on a Saturday, and, and, and a man, he was probably in his 50s or early 60s, was in the sanctuary and had the vacuum cleaner out, and he was... He was vacuuming the floors. And, uh, and as I was walking around the, the sanctuary, because I was in and out of the sanctuary, I noticed he was singing as he vacuumed the floors. So I began to talk with him. I stopped and I began to talk with him. He, I said, I like your attitude. He said, man, and he was Jamaican. He said, Yaman, Yaman. He was Jamaican. He said, Yaman. He said, it's a privilege. I said, what do you mean it's a privilege? He said, it's a privilege to come in here and clean these carpets and get that all ready for Sunday. He said, it's such an honor to be able to help clean the house. That's attitude. Ah, oh, why don't somebody else come in here and back? That's attitude. Yeah. That's attitude. Yeah. <laughs> but that's what makes the man or the woman a part of a team. And he was just excited to be a part of the team, whether it was cleaning the carpets, whether it's shoveling the snow, whether it's whatever, painting the sidewalk, I don't care. <coughs> That's what makes it. There are no lone rangers in the kingdom of God. We're either a part of the team or we're not. Confidence. <laughs> Principle for spiritual leaders of confidence comes from prayer and God's word. If you do not pray, if you do not read God's word, you won't have any confidence. But your confidence when you pray and you read the word of God is in God. Not in yourself. Not in what you your capabilities are, but your confidence comes from God. I like telling the story that I'm an introvert. I keep telling everybody. I keep using it because that's exactly what I am. I always was. I still am. According to statistics, according to tests and all that stuff that they do, I'm still an introvert. But I do not allow the introvert to dictate to me what I am in Jesus Christ. Because you see, I pray and I read the Word of God. And my confidence is where? In the Word of God. And in my spiritual relationship with Jesus Christ. That's where my confidence is. And another principle of leadership is courage. Refusing to compromise when doing God's will. Nehemiah couldn't be dissuaded. When he was doing God's will, nothing was going to stop him. They even tried to pat him on the back and say, come on, let's go hide. They're going to come kill you tonight. Let's go hide in the temple. He said, go on, get out of here. 
Well, I'm not hiding from nobody because his confidence was not in man. It was in the things of God. And because of that, you get courage where you might be afraid to, uh, that somebody might be coming to take your life or whatever. But in, when you have confidence and you are in the Word of God, you will get courage. And as a leader, you will stand up and you will say, this is the way it's going to be. Not as a dictator. But because you're willing to step out and see what God is going to do. Now, the Bible does not say anything about being in the will of God, but of doing the will of God. I like that. That's from missionary Mike Tuttle. You know what Brother Tuttle is. And it is true. But what is the will of God? Yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah. That's our representative in this region, Brother Mike Tuttle. Um, when you realize, and this is one of the biggest things, and you'll hear people say, oh, I don't want the will of God done in my life. Oh, Lord, I want your will done in my life. The will of God is to reach the lost. So as long as you're reaching out to reach somebody, talking to them about Jesus Christ, you are doing the will of God. As long as you're encouraging somebody else, as long as you're helping somebody else, you are doing the will of God. That's why if you come in, I'll go back and watch it, and you clean the dishes up, you are doing the will of God because you're helping the church. We can all be in the will of God. And we all should be in the will of God by doing the, what God wants us to do. Well, the lessons from Nehemiah. Restoration and rebuilding. I've been saying this statement a lot lately. When it comes to restoration, everybody deserves second chances. Some of us are on our 15,000 chance, but everybody deserves second chances. Wouldn't you say? Uh -huh. now, some of us have got a lot more chances in there, but that's all right. We still need them. And we all need rebuilding. You say, what do you mean? There's always some part of our life that we can work on. We just have to be willing to listen and hear the Word of God and allow it to affect our lives. Some people say, well, you're a pastor. I like you to preach to them. Oh, I do. Believe you me. Matter of fact, I, uh, even at home, I'll pull out the, because of the time DVDs that they send to us, and I'll sit down, and I'll, they'll be preaching there, and I'll get under conviction in my living room and just begin to weep before God because I need to be rebuilt. The day I want God to stop rebuilding me is the day that he puts me in the grave. There is always room for improvement. Wouldn't you say? Yes. I ain't perfect yet, if I can say it that way. <laughs> so, chapters 1 through 7 is external construction. Protection from those outside the city has to be overcome. Laziness. <laughs> it had been almost 100 years since they had returned to the land. Uh, and the wall still wasn't finished. So he had to overcome laziness. He said to them, he said, wow, come on, you've been here this long, what are you doing? Build the wall. Mockery, there will always be the mockers and the scoffers. You must have a clear direction from God and a vision that will not easily be described. Mockery, oh, you guys can't do that. What are you doing that for that? Look, you know what they said? And here's to Sam Ballant to buy. He said, if a fox comes by and pushes on it, it's going to fall over. That's what they said to him. And, then, and, and, of course, Nehemiah, he had to go and say, get out of here, leave us alone, we'll build, you just give on and get out. And so you're always going to have people that are lazy, and once you get out of their lazy, and then you're always going to have the devil come by and begin to mock what you're doing. God didn't really call you. In chapter 4, verses 7 to 8, there's a conspiracy. If you are not discouraged by mockery, the enemy will enlist help to inspire against the good work you are doing for God. There, the enemy will use somebody to try and tear down what you are doing. 
There used to be an old saying, I'm going to get it either by hook or by crook. If I can't get it one way, I'm going to get it another way. And so, you know, you wouldn't listen to the mockery, so just expect there's going to be somebody that's going to come and make some false accusation against you. There's going to be people who come by and going to tell you, oh, no way, you can't do it. And, and they're going to start telling other people. You ever know, we call them rumors today. You ever notice that the rumor starts by one person? Yeah. Hey, did you know? And then uh, that rumor all of a sudden gets going. <laughs> and then it spreads from one person to another person. So there's a conspiracy to come. And then, of course, in 4, verse 11, the threats, fear, and intimidation are old and familiar to us. That's where he came up to me and I said, come on, let's go hide in the temple because you know what? They're going to come. He's going to bring a group of people to slay you tonight. Don't let that intimidation come against you. Say, look, God's given me a purpose. He's given me a, a desire, and I'm going to do it. Especially, you know, if you're working under the, under the path of the local assembly and somebody comes by and, and starts intimidating, you say, no, no, you watch that. You, if you do that, you're going to hurt yourself. Say, look, the pastor knows I'm doing this. He's asked me to do it, so just leave me alone and let me do it. There's always going to be somebody jealous. Well, why did the pastor ask you? Why didn't they ask me? Jealousy and stuff like that. And those things happen. That's a shame that it happens in the church, but it does. But you know what? We don't worry about threats. We just keep doing what God wants us to do. And I'm watching the time. Ezra reads the book of the law of Moses from the light early morning until midday. The people were attentive to the reading of the word. How long do you think that was? Very close. It could be between six and ten hours. Because actually, early light was six o'clock in the morning. That's the first watch. Or second watch. Um, and from 6 till noon, but it says midday. Midday was from noon till 4. Oh, that's when we get next up. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yep. So and you could be between 6 and 8 hours long, or 10 hours. And the people were attentive to the reading. They stood. Ezra read the law and gave the sense so that they might understand what he read. This is the principle of humanity. Chapters 11 to 13 was renewed commitment to the covenant. So we can see here that Nehemiah, Ezra, are both talking about the restoration of Israel. And next month will be your test, and then we'll just finish off. The last one will be Esther. We'll do that in June, our last class. So we see that we can look at these two men that have, and uh, Zerubbabel was also involved here, three men I should say, that God called to bring the children of Israel back to the house of God. We see that they were uh, instrumental in bringing back the religious practices, they were instrumental in rebuilding the temple and also in rebuilding the religious practices of that day. We see they faced opposition, but we see how they faced it and how they stood up for the things of God. That should encourage us to do the same thing. We don't belligerent. We're not nasty, but we do do the things of God. And we do it without fear or favor. We just do it because God has called us to do it. Any questions? All righty then. Next month will be your test. And I do believe you folks have the new birth with Brother Cassandra. And that'll be me again at 2.15. So, yeah, Brother Kersant is, is uh, at work today. He couldn't get today off. So, 
I will see you again at 2 o'clock. Hey, you got next month? I'm going to order next month. Virginia. No, I'm not. Do you want to do it? Huh? Are you going in June? No. <coughs> My wife is. She's going in June. I'm not going for that one. That's my uh, grandson's graduation. All right. She's gone. So, but not me. All righty then. See, sometimes you don't know you don't ask. Got <laughs> food? Mm -hmm. We're going for food?